but it's recording. Hey, Andrew. Hi, Andrew. I was Hi, just Drew. putting into chat. Do you want us on video or not? I'm happy to turn it off. I'm also happy to, to let Bob know that he has an audience. <laughs> yeah. And there's okay, I got a message that says we're being recorded by continuing to be in the meeting. You are consenting to be recorded. So I should hit continue, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Unless you object to being recorded. Are there still people coming in, Stella? Yes, a lot. <laughs> so I just keep we'll refreshing. Yeah, okay, like one more minute maybe and then we can. Yes, so do you uh, want me to start? Uh, well, I do not want them in. I don't think so. Um, let me give them a minute. Okay. Think they're still coming or can we get started? Yes, all right. Um, let's get started. Hi, everyone. My name is Stella Kim, one of the um, co chairs of the SLAS SIGMI. I'm an assistant professor at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you all for joining this exciting event today. Before we start the, today's webinar, I'd like to talk briefly about our SIGMI. As many of you already know, the title of our SIGMI is Contemporary Issues in Scaling, Linking, and Equating. And as the title implies, uh, within the umbrella of NCME, we create our own space to provide a home for professionals and students to promote and collaborate on evolving measurement issues around test scaling, linking, and equating. As you may know, joining our SIGMI is free and you can simply sign up through the NCME web, web, website. We also have our own website. If you'd like to look around and see what we're doing and what we have done so far, please feel, feel free to take a moment. I will um, put it uh, the link in the chat box shortly. All right, so I think it's time to start the first session in the webinar series. The title of the webinar series is Storytelling, the History of Scaling, Linking, and Equating, and Looking to the Future. Broadly speaking, the series is broken into two segments. The first segment will span three weeks, including today, and will feature uh, SLA legacy scholars. Each legacy scholar will lead a one hour webinar discussion and the topics will include, but not be limited to how they ended up researching SLED methods, their biggest accomplishments, uh, unfinished business, uh, field projections over the next 10 years the, and the perceived impact by the pandemic. The second segment will spend one or two weeks and will feature emerging SLAS uh, scholars. Emerging SLAS scholars will discuss similar topics and also they will respond to the legacy scholars' views on SLAM methodology gaps and future directions. Currently, three webinar series, each featuring a legacy scholar, have been scheduled to take place from today until May 11th, each spaced one week apart. The three legacy scholars are um, Robert Brennan, Neil Durance, and Alina Bundabi. 
We are very excited to start off this exciting event with our first speaker, Dr. Bob Brennan today. Uh, Jamie Malatesta, the other co-chair of the SLASIGMI will give you a brief introduction to him. All right, thanks, Don. Um, hi, everyone. I am Jamie Malatesta and co-chair of the NCME SIGMI on scaling, linking, and equating. I'm a senior psychometrician at the Graduate Management and Missions Council, or also known as GMAC. It is my pleasure to introduce to, you, introduce to you the first legacy scholar in our series of planned webinars, Dr. Robert Brennan. So Dr. Robert Brennan is EF Linguist Chair in Measurement and Testing Emeritus and the founding director of the Center for Advanced Studies in Measurement and Assessment at the College of Education at the University of Iowa. Dr. Brennan is the author or co-author of numerous journal articles and several books, including Generalizability Theory, test equating, scaling, and linking methods and practices. Also, he is the editor of the fourth edition of Educational Measurement in 2006. Dr. Brennan has served as vice president of Division D of the American Educational Research Association, AERA, and the president of the National Council on Measurement and Education, NCME. He is a co-recipient of the 2000 NCME Award for Career Contributions to Educational Measurement, recipient of the 2004 EF Lindquist Award for Contributions to the Field of Educational Measurement, sponsored by the AERA and ACT. He's also the recipient of the 2011 Career Achievement Award from the Association of Test Publishers and the recipient of the 2020 AERA Division D Lin Award. In addition to this long list of accolades, Dr. Brennan has been a guiding voice, a mentor, and a friend to not only me, but to so many in our field. Without a doubt, his influence on our field extends far beyond what can be captured on paper. It is my sincere honor and pleasure to present to you, Dr. Brennan. Thank you, Jamie and Stella. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, I'm delighted to be able to give this webinar. I hope uh, the people who are listening on the other side of this screen of mine will find it informative and perhaps occasionally entertaining. I'll tell a few stories about my involvement with SLE and uh, something about my 50 year walk through the field of educational measurement. As you will see, it's been anything but conventional. I have a series of slides I'll present and I'll go over them at various levels of detail and try to watch a clock so that they'll, I'll leave time at the end for questions and discussion as you wish. So let me begin. We're going to talk about a little bit about my graduate uh, school background, some major references in the field. SLE prior to 1980, SLE as a transition, 1980 as a transition to SLE, which I think is a kind of a watershed year. And my entree into the field and subsequent work, what I think I've learned and some challenges and predictions. So a little bit of background. As a kid growing up in Boston in the 1950s, all I ever really wanted to do was play right field for the Boston Red Sox. The fact that I didn't have too much talent and a lot of enthusiasm seemed to me to suggest that I might have a problem, but nonetheless, I was convinced the Red Sox were a promising proposition. Fast forward a little bit further to the summer of 1967, and I found myself in Harvard Square, just having been admitted to an uh, a program at Harvard for an MAT in math sponsored by the National Science Foundation. And the first meeting we had as a group with the dean at the time said to us, congratulations, you've made it into Harvard. Now you can do whatever you want. You just got to have a reason. And it doesn't have to be a particularly good one. And I'm not kidding. That literally is pretty much literally what he, what he said. I thought he was kidding, of course, but the truth is I wound up taking him pretty much at his word. A few months later, after being admitted, um, I got an assistantship at the Computer Aided Instruction Laboratory, the CIA laboratory, working under a psychologist named Larry Stolyaro. Uh, at that time, I knew a fair amount about math. I knew nothing about computers. Uh, 
I had only as much measurement as was required to get a certificate to teach mathematics in the school in the state of Massachusetts. That was pretty much it. And although many of you may not want to believe this, the truth is I never took a graduate course in measurement at Harvard through all that time. There were no courses in measurement at Harvard. That, however, didn't stop Larry Stollier all much from essentially making me at the advanced stage of 23, a principal investigator for a very large three-year contract with the US Naval Academy to evaluate one of the world's very first large-scale real-time experiments in computer-aided instruction and testing. So I taught myself as much measurement as I could, mainly studying the first edition of Ed Measurement, uh, edited by Thorndike, and the newly published Lord and Novick. This was 1968. My friend and classmate Joe Crick taught me computer programming. I taught him a little bit about measurement. And I began learning about all sorts of other new things then, criterion reference testing, programmed instruction, which was essentially the precursor to CAT in a sense, item forms, the beginnings of artificial intelligence, et cetera. For those of you who don't know Harvard, when, when you get admitted to Harvard, and it may not be true now, you had access to every course in Harvard and every course at MIT, which was just down the street. Um, it was a incredible experience. And this was also during the Vietnam War. So walking through Harvard Square was a bit of a minefield, literally not quite a minefield, but rocks and such were not unusual occurrences. In short, in the conventional sense, Harvard taught me virtually nothing about measurement. But Harvard gave me a priceless opportunity to learn. In retrospect, I was very lucky. I found that passive learning wasn't my thing. Active involvement with measurement research was then and to this day. A bit of 30,000 foot background on, on the field of SLE as I see it. Uh, you can get a pretty good sense of the field by tracking the four editions of Ed Measurement and the related chapters. Uh, the Linguist volume was the first and Flanagan's chapter, and then the Thorndike volume was the second, and Angoff's chapter on scale norms and equivalent scores. And uh, was, it is hard to overestimate, overstate how important that chapter by Angoff was then and actually still is. Then Bob Lynn's third edition, um, Nancy Peterson, Mike Colin, H.D. Hoover had a chapter on scaling and norming and equating, Mike Colin, one on scaling and norming. Uh, in the fourth edition that I edited, and uh, Paul Holland and Neil Duran's linking and equating also in that edition. The three editions of, Ed, of uh, Colin and Brennan reference, summarize, and integrate most of the history since since 1970 up to about 2014. There's also the Kernel Method book by Von Davia, Holland and Thayer and several excellent edited books. But that's one way to get a perspective on the field. For some areas in our field, uh, you can also get a good perspective by looking at what's in the various edition of the standards. But I don't think scaling, linking and uh, in equating is a, is a terribly productive way to get a sense of uh, how things evolve. Largely hidden uh, for quite a while was, except for the chapter by, by Bill Angloff, um, pretty much scaling, linking, and equating was just in the background. There were three major K through 12 testing programs at the time, ITDS and ITED out of Iowa with a publisher of Houghton Mifflin, the California Achievement Tests, CTB McGraw-Hill, Stanford Achievement Tests, Harcourt, now Pearson. Measurement programs of University of Iowa was, was clearly around in Iowa testing programs. So Linguist, Tyronimus were very visible. Uh, two of their students uh, turned out to be very influential in our field, Nancy Peterson and Mike Cullen. Columbia had Thorndike and Hagen. They had a book on measurement. Uh, they developed COGAT. Uh, an ability test, and there was a long history of involvement between Columbia and uh, Iowa uh, 
uh, through the joint uh, scaling and equating of COGAT and of the Iowa tests. Uh, there were many, not many, but there are other measurement programs that are highly vis visible, but not in scaling, linking, and equating. So Stanford was one, Chicago was certainly another, Wisconsin was certainly another, uh, and, and there were others that were quite good, but scaling, linking, equating, uh, there wasn't much going on there. College admissions was very visible, relatively high stakes. The SAT has always been owned by the college board, but for decades, ETS really developed, administered, scored the whole thing, and did all the equating, scaling, linking that might be involved. So many people thought the SAT was owned by ETS. The ACT assessment had been started by Linquist as a competitor to the SAT. Uh, and so it had been around since the late 1960s. There were concordances, linkings, they were act sac concordances, and pretty much they were literally under the tape. Nobody wanted to admit they had them, but everybody had one underneath the blotter on their desk if they had to use it. That's pretty much the way it was. Licensure, licensure and certification wasn't that visible, except for a few uh, major exceptions. One was the National Board of Medical Examiners, but clearly it was a very high stakes kind of enterprise. NAEP was around, but it was largely an item level testing program. Uh, at that point, it didn't, it, not shortly thereafter, things changed dramatically, but it wasn't influential around then. So up until the, uh, the late 1970s, things were rather opaque in this field. And then there was a transition. And it was about 1980, obviously it's not exactly 1980, but there was a transition. Um, one, I, one, one thing I, I thought I'd tell you about, uh, about that transition is at that time on public radio, there was a show called A Prairie Home Companion with Ka Garrison Keeler. It was set in Lake Wobegon, Minnesota. And one of the beginning statements every time the program was on was, this is a place where all the women are strong, all the men are good looking, and all the children are above average. And that became something of a cornerstone of an issue that arose. There was a physician in Tennessee who began who noticed that in these three well-known grade level testing programs, student scores seemed to increase for about seven years and then they dropped off a ledge and then they increased again for another seven years. And he was complaining about that. Well, what was obviously happening is, is these programs worked on seven year cycles. And so after seven years, they'd have a new scaling, new equations and things like that. And they, the tests were not, they were treated semi-confidentially, but obviously the teachers had access to them from year to year. So the kids were getting better. So that, that became a public issue that's began, that brought issues of equating to the fore a bit. But even more so was New York State, which um, put in place some truth and testing legislation that required the release of test forms at right away after they were administered in New York. ETS and ATT were really very worried about that. ETS in particular uh, was making noises to the effect that they never be able to uh, provide the SAT because they'd have to have so many forms it would be prohibitively expensive. So there was a lot of visibility for that. There were a lot of testing critics around. One of them had been around for some time since the late 60s, started in Cambridge in Center for Fair Testing, Fair and Open Testing called Fair Test. They're still around. Um, there was a great increase in the availability of computers and that made a huge difference, especially with respect to ease of computing and computer speed which was and had been to that point an impediment to use of IRT. There was also a persistent increase in the, in the visibility of accountability movements using tests for accountability and a noticeable increase in specialty professions, especially medical, versus all of which wanted or needed a testing component. Most of these things happened not all at the same time, but within a fairly narrow frame of time, and they forever changed the nature of the SLE field. 
At least that's how I see it. My entry into the field started at about 1980. I had gone to ACT in uh, 1976. Um, and at that point, I had very little knowledge about SLE or experience with it, except for Angot's chapter that I knew pretty well and the work I did at Harvard. But then in about 1979, uh, I was asked to found the measurement research department and we immediately became responsible for equating the ACT assessment, which had been done by Linquist and one of his students up till then. And we also became responsible for anything having to do with psychometrics with respect to contract testing programs with NACT was getting into that business at those days. So my first involvement with SLE was for the multi-state professional responsibility exam, which is an ethics test taken by people in law school before they, they're permitted to enter the field of law. Uh, the 50, it was a 50 item test. Cindy Schmeiser at ACT did the test development. I was gonna be responsible for all of the equating and related stuff. Problem was, we had no computers at ACT. I knew something about computer programming, uh, but no computers. If we wanted to do any computing, we basically did it, drove down to the University of Iowa, Wig Center, submitted the job, came back later on, picked it up, went back. I had only 24 hours to do the first equating of MPR. I figured that wasn't gonna be a workable solution. So what I did is I laid out Angoff's equations for the kind of equating I was going to do. And I had 24 hours to get it done. I literally spent all of 24 hours with a hand calculator, piece of paper, in order to do the first equating of MPR. That was my first experience. I was also responsible for getting the act assessment equated. And I knew I couldn't do that and everything else. I had tried to hire Mike Cohen about two years earlier, but he wanted to go teach. He went to teach at Hofstra and he had had enough of that after a while. So I tried to hire him again. And this time he accepted. I put him, I made him responsible for recording the act assessment. Um, there's a fairly long story there, but I can tell you that um, most of what the field recognizes as cubic spine smoothing really came out of Mike's work in trying to equate the act assessment back then. My major scale and linking equating work at ACT falls into, into these categories, I think. First of all, in the mid, 19, mid to late 1980s, ACT decided that they wanted to basically give the ACT assessment a redo, full redo. So that was going to require scaling, vertical scaling, because we had the ACT plus kind of easier version of the ACT assessment, equating, of course, and linking because we were exact concordances. So the, the, the entire scope of SLE in a sense was, was in fact involved in that design of the, the act assessment. A little bit of a story that I was on a committee along with Cindy and others who were, who were given the job of advising the president whose name was Olaf Davidson on how to proceed with this activity. And so I had some experience now with equating the act assessment. And I found out as did Mike that we were having a bit of a problem. We didn't seem to have enough top on the score scale. There's a history there that I don't have time to go into. But basically given that lack of a top, I made an obvious suggestion. Instead of one to 36, let's use one to 40. And that was my one and only strong suggestion to the president. The president came back with a list of guiding principles, which I think is a very good idea to do in a case like this. The first guiding principle was the score scale shall be one to 36. That was my introduction to politics. I mean, basically what it came down to is very simple. One to 36 was essentially a brand. It was like Coke. 200 to 800 was the SAT brand. If you change the brand, people were worried about you'll never be able to sell the program. So that was my, one of my initial introductions, very, uh, very visible introductions to pay attention to politics, it matters. 
Uh, in order to, I felt strongly that we needed to document what was going on. There was very little documentation available for what really went on with the testing program. So I took it upon myself to edit a monograph that came to be called Methodology Used in Scaling the Act Assessment in PAC Plus. Largely Mike Cohen and Brad Hansen, who died very, very prematurely uh, some years later. And I were the authors of that with help from Deb Harris and uh, Richard Sawyer. And then shortly thereafter, Mike and I decided we wanted to write a book in equating. It came out in 1995. Um, roughly speaking, Mike wrote about two thirds of it. I wrote about a third, um, but we both probably read three or four times the whole thing. So I think we would both say we hold ourselves jointly responsible for whatever was in it. It took about three years of sporadic work. After all, we did have day jobs. This was an, technically an act sanctioned activity that I, we were undertaking. We just did it. And it was based upon joint research and especially experience. In 1994, I went over to the University of Iowa as Link was chair and uh, director of ITP. And that's when I really got to know K through 12 scaling, linking, and equating issues. Not so much because I did it, others did it, but obviously I was overseeing it. So I got to know a lot of what was going on. And I hired my column again. Uh, as an aside, if you want to be a good administrator, there are two or three things you need to do. One is hire good people. And the second is support them. And the third is stay out of their way. If you do those three things, you'll generally speaking do pretty well. And that hiring Mike Cohen was obviously a, a very important issue. I founded CASMA around 2002 and stayed as its director, first director for a while. During that period of time, where there were a couple of revisions of Colin and Brennan. Um, and at the, also, we had a very large contract with the college board, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a moment, but it involved the development of equating recipes by four of us, which is essentially open source code for equating. As an aside, I will tell you one thing that may not be a popular statement, but it's something I believe in strongly. I'm very disappointed with our field generally and others as well, because so much of what is important in terms of programs that are routinely used are hidden or proprietary, which makes it extraordinarily difficult to know what is actually being done. Sometimes that may not matter too much. Other times, it matters a lot. It's especially true with IRT programs these days. Um, but I wanted to at least make equating recipes open source uh, so that there would be no doubt about what was actually being done within the code. That takes a long time to do. It took me four years uh, to work with the re equating recipes. Roughly speaking, all of the major things I've ever undertaken in my career fourth edition of Ed Measurement, um, equating recipes, Colin and Brennan book, a book on G-theory. They seem to take four years. It's a magic number or a statement that I'm very slow. I don't know, but it seems to be universal. That work with the college board involved hiring Wan Chan Leaves, the current director, and Tenyu Wang. They did all of the replications of old SAT equatings. They consulted with me and others on the redesign of the new SAT, and we replicated new SAT equatings, and it's, that is still being done in CASMA right now. Throughout that period of time, I did an awful lot of teaching, consulting, and workshops on scaling, linking, and equating. So that's more or less the history of how I got involved with this field and and what I wound up doing, and the people with whom I wound up doing it. And those people were all very important. I'm a strong believer in uh, collaborative efforts by people to do good things. Um, and that I've been that way all my, all my life. Just one moment. So what do I think? 
what do I think I've learned through all of this effort? And these are some things that, are, that occurred to me in trying to prepare for this webinar. SLE benefits from collaborative efforts among test owners, test developers, psychometricians, and users of test scores. Silos can be bad news. The field seems to be moving more and more to, in the direction of silos. Um, if you go back to the early history, uh, people tended to be work much more collaboratively and together who had primary responsibilities in different areas. I strongly believe, I strongly fear if test development gets too disassociated from psychometric work, um, it will create and does, does create problems. So I strongly believe in that joint effort. Equating adjusts for differences in difficulty, not content. I don't know how many hundreds of times I've said that, but it's worth repeating. Generally speaking, the goal of equating is to satisfy a matter of indifference criterion. In other words, it should be kind of a matter of indifference which form of a test an examinee takes. Scale scores are the scores that really matter because they are the scores that are used to make decisions about examinees. And as such, they should have, in my opinion, as easily interpretable characteristics as possible. Constant SEMs help a lot. Still, scale scores by their very nature are somewhat arbitrary, but that which is the score an examinee sees is important. That which is a score that a decision maker uses, that's important. So scale scores are very important, which means all the statistics that we routinely see having to do with raw scores may be somewhat informative, but they miss the point to an extent because they don't focus on the primary issue, namely the reported scores to examine these. The three most important considerations in scaling, linking, and equating, in my opinion, are all design issues. Design of a table of specifications for a testing program. The, the data collection design, with a strong preference on my part for a random group design. And if you don't have a random group design, then the design for the common items that will link forms of a test together. Methodology, no matter how well sophisticated or well conducted, cannot overcome serious design flaws. Methodology is a tool, it's an important tool, but it's not the answer. And I do have a fear that as time has gone on in the past 20 years, we've moved further away from focusing on design and more to focusing on methodology. And that I think is a mistake. Design issues always supersede methodology because if you get the design issues wrong, methodology is not gonna correct for them. There are always errors in what we do, hopefully not mistakes, that's in and of itself not a problem. That's just a reality. The jo our job should be dis to describe them, quantify them, explain them, report them, but not cover them up. My sense of my whatever number of years I've experience I've had here is that every psychometric generation seems to have to relearn many of these issues as time goes on. Now, one of the things that I think uh, Jamie and Stella wanted me to consider and do is, well, what do I think about the future of the, the field? How do I see it? And obviously, this is a debatable issue. Others would certainly see things somewhat differently, I think, but I'll tell you how, how I kind of see things. And there are some places that are some things that I think aren't often differentiated as well as they as well as they should be. So let me start with start with that. Um, there really are three classes of types of test programs. This may be overly simplistic, but I think it's very useful. K through twelve these days 
um, primarily there are either one scale score that matters, proficient, or three, basic, proficient, and advanced. Let's assume basic, proficient, or advanced. Some cases, all scores matter, but not most cases. I remember one discussion I had uh, on a New York TAC, for example, a few years ago, in which I asked, well, what's the lowest possible scale score and the highest possible scale score? And people had to sit back and think because it just wasn't an issue. It was other score scales that were the issue in the middle. Admissions testing, college and others, nearly all scores are important. Licensure and certification, most of the time, one or only a small number of scores in the middle of the distribution are important. And I think it's really worth recognizing those differences because it impacts what you need to focus on when you're actually dealing with scaling, linking, and, and equating issues. Um, so, you know, if you've got only uh, one score that's an, an important, as in often in licensure and certification, uh, it, it's kind of irrelevant uh, what's going on on the top of bottom end. Important SLE statistics, in my, my opinion, are SEMs and false positive, false negative error rates. I am not a fan of coefficients. I don't think they typically tell me much that I can really understand and, and use usefully. They may sound good. Everybody thinks they know with a correlation coefficient of 0.80. I seem to be the only one who's not so sure. Uh, it matters, I think, if you understand something deeply or you don't. In K through 12, I think we clearly need conditional standard errors of measurement at the various cut scores, and we need often false positive and false negative error rates, or estimates of these things, obviously. College and, and other types of admissions, we pretty much need CSEMs, if not throughout the, into the entire range of the score scale, through a lot of it. Uh, licensure and certification, um, CEM and cut scores, false positive and false ne negative error rates, we, we definitely should have, I think. Now, I've said CSEMs here, conditional SEMs, because I think the SEMs we compute, the overall SEMs are summative, but they don't have a lot of practical value, unless, of course, they're all the same. What typically we need to know about is the conditional SEMs in the particular schools of interest to us. I want to skip CAT for a moment and go to the, the third category here. Um, the driving forces that I think that may dominate a lot of our work. If I were giving this presentation 20 years ago, for example, this would be a it would be on the list of things I talk about, but I wouldn't emphasize it nearly so much. But these days, external driving forces are really very important. Um, in K through 12, uh, currently ESSA, federal government ESSA requirements are very important. And to be very crass about it, they're important because they're requiring the states to do certain things. Um, but there's also a penalty that's involved and the penalty is severe. It's potentially withholding funds, which the federal government has. Most of the money, about seven to 8% of the funding of education in this country comes from the feds. So states cannot afford to not pay attention to the federal government, which means the federal government drives a lot of things in K through 12. That you may view as good, you may view as problematic. However you view it, it definitely is an issue you have to pay attention to. Uh, admissions, college, and otherwise. Uh, public perceptions are really becoming more and more of a driving force. And there's always been some movement to get rid of college admissions testing programs, for example. It's generally failed, and fa in fact, failed miserably because the amount of testing has actually increased. I'm not so sure we can count on that in the future. 
we'll probably have more court cases. The public perception of college admissions testing is not positive. I think that's unfortunate and I think it's probably misrepresentative of the testing programs themselves, but I think it's a reality. Uh, and I don't think the major college admissions testing programs can, can avoid this. So that I see as potentially a pretty serious problem, public perceptions. Licensure and certification is in a much more stable area. Their job is public protection. You don't want to have a physician doing surgery on you if they in fact haven't been able to pass some pretty stringent tests in order to um, lead you to the conclusion that they really are competent in the field. Um, in, a, in a sense, I think licensure and certification is, is in a much easier uh, political state than the other two types of testing programs. Also, licensure and certification tends to push the envelope um, quite a bit in some places. Uh, simulations are, are a good example, and I think that's a, that's a good thing. Um, so there's, those external driving forces, I think, need to be kept in mind, and they will be, they will be important. Likelihood of use of CAD, I think we all know that CAD is becoming used more and more frequently. I doubt it's going to be used much for account, in accountability context with K through 12. In formative context, I think it's likely. College admissions testing programs, I think, are trying to move in that direction. I don't know if they're going to be successful with it. There are some very practical problems they're going to have to overcome to do that. Licensure and certification has the most likelihood of doing very good, I think, CAT work. Measuring growth is an issue for some testing programs. Clearly it is for K through 12. Measuring growth, measuring change is one of the most enduring problems in psychometrics. It's not going to go away, I don't think. Uh, will continue to struggle with it, but it continues to be necessary. We might see a little bit of it in college and other admissions testing programs. It's a non-issue in licensure and certification. So overall, as I see it, uh, the challenges in K through 12 are going to be very substantial. In college admissions and other admissions, they'll be substantial. In licensure and certification, as expensive as the enterprises may be, as important as they be, in some senses, I think their jobs are easier. They're, they're somewhat relatively straightforward, but they are very expensive and they're innovative. That's my take on uh, issues uh, in the future, as I see it right now. So what do I think are some challenges? One is the messenger message conundrum. Uh, tests by their very nature provide a message. The message is a score. The score gets a meaning attached to it. And the meaning often is not one that the public wants to hear. And that creates an environment in which the easiest, quickest criticism is to criticize the messenger without looking at the importance of the message. So they will, the public will generally view these issues as bias. Psychometrically, that the issue is essentially equity, which is a pretty challenging thing for us to deal with, even first order equity. The only really um, true, truly coherent treatment of equity, I think is Hansen's theorem, which was published in 1991. It's a principled consideration of the whole thing. And the discussion of that is done very well by Holland and Durand in the, um, the fourth edition of Educational Measurement. Virtually all educational tests are multidimensional by design. Tables of specifications are almost always multidimensional. So test developers recognize this very well. The SLE literature and practice for the most part just throws this under the table, doesn't pay attention to it. Sometimes that probably doesn't matter. It certainly matters if we have to select common items to link two forms of a test because we want to have a random group's design. But I suspect it matters a lot more than most of us realize anyway, in all sorts of different ways. Documentation, far too many testing programs have embarrassingly outdated and inadequate published technical documentation. 
I can think of one major testing program right now that hasn't uh, revised their documentation to any substantial degree in 30 years. Protein quality, most testing programs necessitate research into program specific scaling, linking and equating issues to defend the intended inferences about reported scores. Too frequently what I see is people thinking, okay, we've got a problem. What does the literature have to say? We'll pick out the best solution or a good one and implement. Sometimes that's fine. But very often what you really do is need to conduct your own research in that program specific context to really understand what's going on. That's what I mean by a protein quality. In terms of published research, my sense is that we have less published research in SLE than relatively speaking, relative to the amount of testing in recent years than we used to have. I can't prove that, but that's certainly my perception. And I think there are a couple of reasons for that. As testing has become more competitive and more politicized, and it has in the past few decades, competitive concerns loom large, and they are often used as excuses by testing companies for lack of transparency and in published research. There, there are several many testing companies that used to routinely uh, publish in referee journals, make presentations that were very visible and uh, not always um, uh, suggesting that what our company was doing was the best that could be done, but they did it anyway. And that's not happening nearly as much as I think it used to be. The second reason published research, I think, is not so visible is if you do it well, you've got to be discussing errors. The trouble is people associate the word error with mistake. Um, and so there's a tendency not to want to talk about errors. If you don't talk about it, then you cover them up. Still on balance, I think we've come a very, very long way in the 50 years since Angoff 1971, um, which was, I think, a watershed publication by a very talented man. But there is still a lot much more that can be done and hopefully will be done by the rest of you who are listening or participating in this webinar. Final thought, SLE is all about reported scores that often have significant consequences, intended or not, for test takers, various subgroups and or educational systems. Good SLE work may be hidden and it often is. It may be opaque because it's complex to others, but it really does matter. It matters a lot because it scores that are the things that get to decision makers and students, and they are the basis on which really important decisions are made about people. So it really does matter. Thank you very much. Just by the way, the Red Sox still haven't called me. I'm waiting. Jamie, Stella, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Brennan. Um, that was really great. So um, we have one question already in the chat that I'll start with um, from Hannah Anderson. So she says, if you're a recent recent PhD graduate interested in a position position in test development, uh, SLE, et cetera, what resources and companies would you recommend to get our foot in the door and to be mentored in this field? Cool. So. Um... I want to be careful how I answer, answer this um, because I don't want to I don't want to downgrade the importance of, of uh, particular companies. Um, the company is important in choosing. Now, often location may be an issue that's of consequence, but certainly you want to try to pick a company that's stable, for sure. I personally think the more important consideration than picking a company for the most part is picking the people, but picking a company that has a group of people with whom you think you can work and learn effectively. So I frequently advise new PhDs not to go to a company where you'd be the only psychometrician when they get out. 
you may be very talented and you may have a lot of good background, but when you're trying to develop a career, it's really tough to do it alone. You, you need to be in communication with others one way or the other. But if you do that and stay in communication with other people one way or the other. Um, if I've had success in scaling, linking and equating, some of it I'd like to believe is attributable to me. But the reality is an awful lot of it is attributable to the work I had with so many other talented people. One obvious one is, is Mike Cohen, uh, but he's not the only one by, by any means. Um, the, the other thing that is, I think, important with new people is if they go to a very big testing program, there's a possibility of getting lost within the program. And some people just want to take the skills they've got and apply them in particular contexts, and they don't want, they don't have a great interest in pursuing research, and maybe that's okay. But for the most part, you don't want to get into a context where you're just one of so many that you don't have a chance to stand out, but you don't want to be the only one because it's so difficult, I think, to develop your career if you're doing it alone. Doable, but difficult. Thank you. Uh, we have one more question from Andrew. Uh, Bob, can you say more about why or when equal CSEMs are useful in scaling uh, for what implied uses? Say that again, Stella, I'd miss something. There. Um, can you say more about why or when equal CSEMs are useful in scaling for oh. what implied uses? Yeah. This is, a, just, this is almost not a technical issue so much as it is a practical one. Um, just about every testing company, if they put out information about their scores, um, they'll put out a reliability coefficient, which is almost a, always a lousy answer. Um, hopefully they'll put out a standard error of measurement, which is better. But the trouble is if that's all they put out, the standard error of measurement at one region of the score scale can be quite a bit different from the standard error of measurement at another region of the score scale. But they will typically say things like, add or subtract one standard error of measurement, and you've got a 60% probability that your true score is in that range. So I'll say something like that. Well, that's just not true for a lot of reasons, usually, but it's certainly not true if the SEMs differ. So, from a very pragmatic point of view, I've come to the belief that unless there's a compelling reason to the contrary, I would try to, just, to create scales if I'm involved in doing so, where I make adjustments such that the conditional scale score SEM are about constant throughout the score scale range, which in fact is true of the ACT assessment, but Mike and I did work on that. It's in fact true for the SAT, or at least that was the goal. Uh, we, we worked uh, on that as well, and, and it's, uh, it's been true in, with some other testing programs. But I won't say I've gotten a lot of traction on that argument, but I do think, unless you can get testing companies to really provide a reasonable range of conditional SEMs for the various score scales, then if it's not a constant score scale, it's going to be mis misinterpreted. Yeah, we have one more question from Andrew. <laughs> so feel free to just uh, speak up, Andrew, if you'd like to. Or anybody else. You yeah, as, as I said in the chat, I'm happy to prioritize other questions, especially from those in the SIG. Thank you. Yeah, if anyone has questions, feel free to unmute and ask them, or you can type them in the chat box and we'll ask for you. I actually have one question uh, because uh, you know my dissertation was a uh, development of multidimensional iron response theory, you know, equating. So I wanted to hear your thoughts on the applicability of multidimensional IRT equating to the rear, you know, rear setting. Because uh, so that's, that's a really good question. Um, I don't have a really good answer, but I do have, have an answer. I mean, we're in a situation, all right, I've got a couple of minutes. I want to back off a bit for a moment. 
Um, what, do, when I'm dealing with IRT, and for the moment, I'm going to try to forget the arguments between one, two, and three parameter model issues. Forget that. Back on. And just focus on Lloyd for a moment. When Lloyd was developing IRT, if you read his articles and papers, you will see examples. Almost all of their examples were based off SAT data, or many of them. The SAT at that time was developed, the two, the two tests, quantitative and verbal, they were developed to be unidimensional, literally, to be unidimensional. And so Lloyd was applying a unidimensional model to tests developed to be unidimensional, same time. Most of the tests that I deal with, and I think all of us deal with, are multidimensional by design. That has to raise the question of how appropriate is, is it to use unidimensional IRT in order to do scaling, linking, and equating. It doesn't mean it is wrong. I don't mean that. Uh, it's a researchable issue, how much that matters. But so far, the efforts to use multidimensional IRT <clears throat> have not been terribly successful. And I know, so, uh, I won't name them, but I know a few people who are very well regarded in the IRT field who do not really think there's much future for multidimensional IRT. I don't know whether there is or not. But I do think it's imperative on us to consider those issues because there is a disconnect there. There's a very large disconnect between the test development assumptions, which I think are important because they define the construct. And as such, they are a huge part of any validation idea. And the methodology that we use with our unidimensional IRT. So I just hope people will research this in the context of real data with real live testing programs. I don't think we need more simulations. That's not going to solve the problem. We need to get into it, and the testing companies themselves need to get into it. Remember I said the protein quality? That's one of the things I was thinking about. Every testing program is a bit different. We want to examine this issue, examine it within the context of real data, real live testing programs, and maybe you have some side studies to see what's happening. But we need to understand this issue better. Right now, we've got a conflict that should make us all uncomfortable. Even though I'm not, I really don't want to be interpreted as, as being uh, intensely critical of the use of IRT currently, but I am critical of our, what I think is not a, a very concerted effort to try to come to grips with this seeming conflict. Does that help still? Yes, yes thank you. Uh, we have one more question from Steve Ciretti. Uh, um, most testing programs are not using or are moving away from test forms. What are your thoughts on equating scores from different sets of items based on calibration? My thoughts are that it's dangerous if you, uh, if you need, um, maybe a cough. Fundamentally, what we need to be able to do is say to an examining that it should be a matter of indifference to you whether you take this test on this day with these items or six months from now or it's three months from now with these items in this context. That mixes all of those issues together. We should be able to say it's a matter of indifference. It's very difficult to mount an argument that it is a matter of indifference as you drop away from the various well-known standardized conditions, one of which might be test forms. Can I say it can't be done? No, but I can say, I think that if it's going to be done, then there's a burden on psychometricians to be able to demonstrate that you can still in some meaningful sense satisfy that matter of indifference criterion. Thank you. Uh, so it seems like it's uh, we are running out of time. So it's time to wrap up our session. Um, Jamie, do you like to uh, have a closing remark? 
Uh, I just want to thank everyone for attending. I think uh, Dr. Brennan, especially, I mean, your, your talks are always very uh, informative and uh, have an element of uh, humor to them, which we always appreciate. Um, just, yeah, thank you so much, everyone who, who could attend and join with us today. Yeah, and I really look forward to seeing you next week as uh, we will have Neil Durance for as, uh, as the, our next speaker. So we hope that we can see you again next week. And uh, uh, again, thanks for joining us today. And uh, special thanks to Dr. Uh, Brendan uh, for such a you know amazing uh, you know summary of your life and the summary of the field. I think uh, so. Hope uh, you have a great uh, rest of the uh, day today, and we'll see you next week. Thank you all. I appreciate the opportunity. Take care. Thank you.